got this acne thing right now. It's just anyway. <clears throat> Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the Great Exhibition Road Festival, or welcome back to the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Uh, for some of you, can I have a quick show of hands who's been before? A couple of people have been before, so that means a couple of people are new to the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Welcome, welcome to Imperial College London um, and to our um, special, um, uh, one of our special talks in the Art and Science Program of the Great Exhibition Road Festival. Um, all this week we have a series of free uh, public events uh, for you to attend, put on by the uh, partners in the festival, um, the cultural institutions in the area alongside Imperial College. My name is Simon Levy, I'm your uh, host today. Uh, I had to check my notes there because I wasn't quite sure who I am. I am, uh, during my day job, I'm communications manager at the Grantham Institute, which is Imperial College's uh, hub of uh, climate change and environment uh, research. We also uh, teach students and we have an innovation program, all coming up with uh, fantastic um, solutions to climate change and biodiversity crises. One of the projects that we're doing uh, and have done for the past three years is the Grantham Climate Art Prize, um, which this year our theme is biodiversity. Um, and uh, we engage, seek to engage young people aged 12 to 25 uh, in developing, um, designing murals uh, for, for public uh, spaces uh, that kind of communicate what is, what they feel about the biodiversity crisis and uh, um, winning designs are being painted on seven walls across the UK. Um, we also have a uh, pilot project running in Richmond um, where artists and scientists have collaborated in uh, a uh, mural being painted on a railway bridge. And you're going to hear more about that today as well. Um, I can't wait to introduce you to our speakers uh, who we have today. Um, but before that, I have to tell you some COVID housekeeping rules for those who are in the room. Um, so give me a second. Um, firstly, please make sure you stay sitting where you are um, and maintain a social distance of at least a meter from someone outside your household. If you have taken off your mask, I must ask you to put it back on, please. Um, these are our rules for this, um, this festival. Um, and at various points in the next hour, I'll open the discussion for questions and one of the technicians will come to you for with a microphone so you don't have to shout and you can be heard clearly. Um, please wait for them to come with the microphone. Um, finally, when the talk finishes, um, please do clear the lecture theatre um, as soon as possible. We have a quick turnaround to get to the next uh, talks and we must um, cleanse the area. <laughs> Uh, and our lovely speakers also have to uh, have to go on and be cleansed. Um, I'd encourage you to, um, you can wash your hands or sanitize outside the lecture theatre. Um, there's a little station there for that. Okay, and for those of you who are watching us online, um, we will be taking questions at uh, several points. If you're online, if I can encourage you to type your um, questions in the chat and they'll be passed to me um, we'll take them during the Q&A um, session. For those who are in the room, uh, you'll have to put up your hands. As I said, one of the technicians will come to you. So, on to the very exciting topic of today's discussion. Um, oh, I haven't introduced the speakers. Okay. On my immediate left, we have Bryony Benjabbott, who is a creative artist and a producer with a uh, particular interest in nature interconnections. Next to Bryony, we have Will. Dr. Will Pierce is a lecturer in biodiversity at Imperial College London. And next to Will, we have Michelle Miola, um, who is a muralist, an eco-artist, and a community art teacher. So welcome to our panel. Okay, uh, hi, welcome. Uh, so first question, I'm gonna sort of ask this panel to introduce themselves through a couple of opening questions. Dr. Will Pierce, what is biodiversity to you and what does it mean to lose it? So biodiversity 
is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But biodiversity is the variation in life all around us that we see. And that can be the number of species that we have, the variety of forms, shapes, colors, smells uh, for pheromones uh, and sounds that those species make. And of particular interest to myself, actually, in my own research, the history, the evolutionary history they represent. And it matters a great deal to us because all of that variety is what supports life, okay? And so it, whether it be that, you know, you, we all want to eat food, and of course that food is supported by pollinators, it can be trees that, that cleanse the water that we drink. And so biodiversity really is the support system that we depend upon, and so losing it would not be a good thing. Thank you, Will. Um, my next introductory question is for Michelle. Michelle, who is responsible for biodiversity loss? And importantly for the people here and the people listening, what can they do to change that? Um, so in the broader context, I would say governments, um, the capitalist system that we live in, um, the agricultural industry, um, different companies, and all of us as individuals. So um, Professor Dave Gawson has got a petition at the moment where he's trying to get people, at the moment it's only 38,000, um, where we can ban pesticides in urban garden spaces. So if everybody wants to sign that, that would be great, because once it gets to 100,000, it gets debated in Parliament. Um, if people don't have gardens, everyone has got a window ledge. If we can all have some, um, some like planters with pollinator-friendly um, flowers, uh, that's always good. Um, and we need to, uh, yeah, basically all get involved as much as possible. Super, thank you, Michelle. Um, and my next introductory question is for Bryony, therefore. Bryony uh, is working on our project in Richmond that I mentioned. Um, Bryony, can you tell us what you've learnt about the people in Richmond you've been working with? Um, and uh, tell us a little bit, I guess, by doing that and what the project is about. Yeah, yeah. So I guess so my real kind of passion is um, uh, through through public murals and through, through what... Uh, what I call wild drawing walks and workshops is to start to explore our connection to nature. And I've been doing that largely with, with adults. And then I've been doing some workshops with very little children, but I never worked really with students before. And I think, um, you know, as a result of being involved in this pilot, it's just kind of highlighted it's an intergenerational kind of need and desire to feel more deeply and closely connected to our natural landscape. And that there are a lot of barriers to that that we could talk about maybe a bit later um, that are preventing people to, to, to kind of accessing their green spaces or kind of really, um, yeah, feeling uh, equipped or able to kind of relate to, to the natural world and seeing themselves as part of, a, of the wider ecosystem. And there's also like a really, um, you know, through the pilot, I got to work with uh, Will and a couple of other researchers from Grantham. And it was just really wonderful to be able to share that experience of working directly with scientists, which I've done before in my own practice as an artist. But, you know, the, there was such a, appetite for for the detail and the the kind of insights that you offered to the students um, and it, it opened up such a new way of, of looking they were particularly struck by the idea that trees communicate for example so again pick up on that a bit later so I think there's you know their appetite to have those direct conversations with scientists and then also once we were painting the mural the community's response to to the messages that the students were sharing and the conversations that spark from that, the, the community's appetite to kind of connect and, and kind of feel like they are um, able to kind of share their concerns about the crisis and, um, yeah, and, and hear other people's voices and opinions and thoughts on, on it. So, yeah, it was a really kind of wonderful um, experience. Then. Yeah. Thank you. That's really interesting, actually. I wondered, actually, maybe we can find out a bit more about what that's like from the scientist's point of view, what's it like to be part of one of these workshops where you're meeting kids and you, who maybe know something about biodiversity, but they know that they should be passionate about it? What's that like as a scientist to come together with that? If I'm being completely honest with you, it's quite scary. <laughs> um, because, you, you, you know, you never know. The wonderful thing about children is that um, they wear their hearts on their sleeves to, so, to such an extent. And so um, it was really wonderful working with them, and in particular with Bryony, because it really gave an opportunity to sort of see people engaging with these concepts and expressing themselves in a way that I think maybe they haven't even sort of realized as much themselves. I, um, I, I did genuinely find it quite sort of moving, actually, because it really does bring your mind back to 
to being a child. And I, I remember as a child really caring a great deal about conservation and being worried about the, the natural world. That's one of the reasons I'm here today in, in a very literal sense. And so um, it, it was a wonderful experience. And again, really great seeing them looking at nature with a new eye, looking closer and really noticing details that frankly, even I miss when I, I look in a woodland um, because, and seeing them experience that for the first time, it was, it was really wonderful. Um, I wonder actually, Bryony, do you want to show us some of these images yeah, of, of what yeah. you two have been working on together? So I just, We've got, I hope people online will be able this? to see this as well, yeah. Do you want to maybe talk us through kind of how, how this has gone yeah. and maybe how you start these conversations that you've been talking about? Sure, yeah. So, so I had three workshops with, three, uh, with two different schools in Richmond. Um, Waldegrave School and Orleans Park School and in the first workshop I worked with Dr Tilly Collins um, and the second two workshops um, Will was with us as well as um, Holly Focard Tap and uh, so we had three scientists coming into the schools and we were working partnered with Orleans House Gallery and um, so at certain points we also went to their site and they have an amazing woodland that surrounds the gallery and so we did a lot of workshops there and basically you know we kind of started the session the first session with Tilly she painted a much a really big picture of what on earth is climate change, how does that affect biodiversity loss, you know, kind of started to talk about what is COP26, because these murals are all going up, you know, in advance of, in preparation for COP26, which is just in a few weeks away. And so kind of talking to these students who a lot of them hadn't heard of COP26, you know, about what on earth would be happening at this conference and um, the opportunities and the challenges there. And then she kind of really honed it down into Richmond and the, the, the climate change that's happening right now. So she was talking a lot about the kind of flooding that's happening in the area and we we're looking at maps of that and things and what might be happening in the future and just kind of really referencing some of the local species there and, and having, um, it was a dialogue with the students about what they'd noticed, how they felt and, and um, about, about the things that they'd been seeing. Um, and then we started to focus again, even further in that session um, to look at um, trees um, and the roles that trees play in urban environments in, you know, in, in shade, in carbon um, capture, in kind of preventing flooding, cleaning the air. So having those conversations and the students did some huge kind of drawings. Um, I think I've got another picture here of, of one tree whilst Tilly um, narrated all of the various different um, roles that trees play in our lives and kind of really brought them you know, as she was talking, they were drawing what she was, um, what she was kind of, they were kind of illustrating what she was sharing. And they were really kind of honing in on how dynamic trees are as well. So kind of seeing them again as, as active living beings that are part of our community. So that was really wonderful kind of opener. So we kind of came down to, to a specific place. And then we had the session in Orleans House Gallery's grounds. So here's Will with one, some of the students um, from Orleans Park School. And this is when we worked with one particular oak in the grounds and what we were looking at the, um, we, were looking, we had the magnifying lenses from the lab um, and they were looking at the leaves, at the bark, at the, at the roots, literally Will at one point was digging up roots for them to study. Um, and having this more kind of detailed conversation in the place, we were drawing a lot of, you know, thinking about, about the sounds around and all the different kind of species that hold, you know, hold this, this tree as a home. and. Um, it was, you know, these are some of the, the drawings that came out of, out of these sessions. You know, it, I think going back to the, the thing that I said that really opened up a, a whole new way of thinking was this idea that trees communicate. And this was sparked by, in the first session, when Tilly was talking a lot about the, the, the airborne kind of communication between trees that are being attacked by pests. And, and it was a bit mind blowing for, for the students to kind of, to kind of hear that and realize that they were, they were the trees were kind of in a community and they were perhaps communicating right now whilst we're standing there. But then also Will um, in the second session started to get us to think about other connections, communications that are happening that we can't see underground. So, you know, the, the studies of the roots, but also the, the fungal networks as well. Um, and all along throughout that, that was when I was facilitating them to, to kind of to draw as they were thinking and to start having conversations um, 
we had a lot of uh, we did some creative writing as well as as drawing for them to start to articulate their emotional response to what they were hearing their very personal experiences of of the landscape but also zooming back out to these bigger themes of of cop 26 and what on earth you know what on earth is happening and what do we want our world leaders and then we thought also about like our neighborhood what do we want our future selves to do or to, to know what we want our past selves to, to know so we're kind of thinking like thinking about all the different kind of conversations that we wish we could have had we even had trees in conversations with trees what would we like to say to the tree if we could join their conversation um so yeah that's going back to the mural but yeah so those are the workshops and so uh, it was just a process of of um you know the the scientists kind of really setting the the scene and then allowing kind of a gradual kind of gentle adding of detail with a kind of stepping in and out occasion to check in with okay what does this mean to us in our in our lives right now here in richmond that's fabulous it's really lovely to see mm -hmm. those images yeah. um i think we're going to see an image later of the final i just kind mural. of revealed it already oh no <laughs> yeah. okay forget you forget you've seen that yeah. it's really great to hear you talk about how art can really convey a message as well. And that's one of the things we really want to bring out with the Grantham Climate Art Prize. Mm -hmm. I want to turn to Michelle now, uh, because Michelle, you've, uh, your experience with, as a muralist, is all about communicating messages, isn't it? Do you want to say a bit more about kind of your work outside of the competition? Michelle is also one of our uh, art prize uh, uh, artists. Um, but do you want to say maybe a bit about kind of what you've been doing and your campaigning work before that? Yeah, so um, I did a lot of work with uh, Greenpeace as a street campaigner and helped to run my local group for several years. Um, so I like getting out on the streets and talking to people about the different uh, issues. So um, then I started doing these big murals as a different way to communicate with people. Um, and I, I liked it because as, as I'm painting, you know this, people stop and ask you what you're doing. Um, so it's a really nice way to engage people in that way. Um, so, yeah, I've done different uh, murals to do with... Uh, do you, oh, yeah, do you want to show some pictures? Yeah. Mm. How can I get to it without showing well, your... Oh, just uh -oh. have to close your eyes. <laughs> Click quickly. <laughs> Blink now online. <laughs> oh, no. It's fine. <laughs> I'm going quickly. Don't look. Going. Okay, back. Uh, okay, so... Um, I'm part of a women's street collective uh, of artists as well. And um, periodically we do different jams where we get together and there are some really talented, amazing women. And so this was one of the ones that I did um, in response to, at the time, President Trump, who was about to open up the Arctic to um, oil industries. So I kind of just wanted to do something. We were talking earlier about um, getting really frustrated and angry about different things. So for me, this is a great way to channel those emotions and then to have other people maybe learn about something that we didn't know about before. Um, so this was, again, this was in response to the Australian bushfires. This was in Leak Street in January, so it was freezing cold. I've got many layers on there. Um, and again, it was, it was really great to have so many different people walking past and it was such a big news item and I just felt really, um, like useless, what can you do? But at least in terms of awareness raising and people trying to find out a little bit more. Um, this one here was, uh, it was linked to a World Oceans Day campaign that Greenpeace were doing. And we went to, um, we went to the government and hand in, handed in a whole load of petitions, signatures, where they were trying to get 30% of the oceans protected by 2030. And that's one of the, um, one of the goals that they're trying to reach in COP26 as well. Um, so I basically just went around and collected all of the rubbish that I could find from the street. And what was a bit depressing was if I needed a Costa coffee cup, I would find it. If I needed a Sainsbury's bag, there would be it. Coca-Cola, obviously, always around. Um, so, yeah, whatever I needed, um, I could find. Uh, and then I don't know if um, you've seen those horrible videos on YouTube with the turtle with the straw up its nose. It's like it's quite a, a powerful thing. So I, that's what I included, and um, the rings around his neck of the beer cans. Um, so yeah, this, this is the sort of work that I do. Um, this one here was uh, to do with the deforestation that was happening with the bushfires in, um, in the Amazon rainforest. 
um, and it was part of the Hackney Wicked Festival. So most of the wall was actually, um, as the forest is, lots of deforestation now. So, I, and I put some statistics and then the smallest corner was what is left, um, which is really sad that, is it not going on? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this, yeah, some statistics there. Do I have anything else? No, okay, I'm gonna hand it back to you. <laughs> can you so tell you can... us, can you tell us, Michelle, a bit about people's reactions? to your work? They're always really positive. I always have people um, who maybe didn't know about an issue and then they were going to go away and do a little bit more research and that's kind of what I like to do with my work is just give people a little introduction. If I've got time while I'm painting I'll stop and have a chat with people as well um, but if not it's kind of a good introduction for them to sort of have an overall idea of what's happening and then maybe go and do a little bit more research of their own, if they're, if they're naturally interested in those sorts of things, which the people that were talking to me were. Um, mm. yeah. I'm interested in this theme of art and activism. And science and activism are not always things we naturally think of as going together. Would you say, Michelle, you're an artist first or an activist first? I, I mean, I've, I've always been an artist, but the activism is like I said, it's a way for me to channel all of those emotions that sometimes I feel are really overwhelming and I could just sit at home and be really depressed or just moan to all of my friends and they get sick of me. Or I can do something that I think is a bit more productive um, and that's why I joined Greenpeace. I do lots of things with Extinction Rebellion. Um, it helps me to channel that and I think a lot of people, they feel the same when it's not just you on your own thinking about these things. You can, there's a sense of solidarity and that collective action. Um, and social for social change to happen, we need to come together as a group. So I think, yeah, art and activism, they go, they complement each other really well um, because art is all about your emotions and your feelings and activism is about action. So when you combine them, I think it makes a great combination. Yeah. Wow. Emotions and feelings, also something we don't commonly, it's a terrible stereotype, we don't commonly associate that with, with scientists. <laughs> I'm, of course, going to ask our scientists, what do you think? I mean, I, I do have emotions and feelings. Uh, <laughs> I can confirm that. If that means I'm about to be fired, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so it's a, it is a difficult one, though, isn't it? But, well, actually, I don't think it has to be difficult. I mean, so a scientist, uh, first and foremost, is, to be a scientist is to care deeply about searching for the truth. And I wake up every day and desperately trying to find ways that I'm wrong. That's really what it is to be a scientist, to look and to question. And the moment you stop doing that, I think you cease being a scientist. Um, so if it were the case that I were to find evidence that we really weren't facing a massive, we weren't in the middle of a mass extinction event, if I were to find evidence that we weren't in the middle of a massive climate crisis, I would be screaming it from the rooftops. Um, and so I think it's difficult because to, to, be a, to be a conservation biologist now, to sort of to have a Cassandra complex, really, to sort of to see the future and, and to have no one to, to worry that people might not listen. And so on one level, I suppose we would call it engaging with policy, and I say we would call it outreach. But, I mean, I don't know what the difference between engaging with policymakers and engaging with the general public and, and, and giving events like this. I, I don't really fully understand the difference between that and activism, I would say. But first and foremost, we are, of course, always scientists. Do you think it impacts what you do as a scientist, the choices you make as a scientist? I think um, people have different approaches to what they research. I try to research questions that I think are important enough that I think not just that I want to know the answer to it, but that society as a whole needs to know the answer to it. And that's the way a lot of my colleagues I know approach things. Um, and so I suppose it does affect, uh, it does affect the research you, you, programs you pursue because, you know, we're, we're trying to answer questions that matter, that will therefore have an impact. And so to that extent, I, I suppose, yes, I do focus my research on trying to find solutions to this, this crisis that we're in. Um, that's not necessarily, it's not my place to implement them, I would say, but I, I do my best to sort of, and in my lab and with my colleagues and collaborators, to, to give people the tools to make those decisions. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to come back to Bryony now because your work, I know, has not always focused on climate change and environment. I know you're also really passionate about health and well-being 
of the people in the communities that you work. Um, do you feel you're an activist amongst uh, uh, of those topics? Uh, how does that how does that work for you? Um, so I think I'm, I think of myself as an artist first, and then maybe an activist with a little a. But I think there is something ac there is something very active about taking up space in the public realm mm. for for murals of 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 this kind. This one is yes, as you say, very explicitly about climate change and biodiversity mm. loss. But the others that I've created, maybe I can show a couple of the examples that were previewed before. Uh, yeah, so this one's, you know, a, um, an exploration of, of the world of lichen, um, and it was for a clean air warp leading through um, a housing estate in Archway that uh, was set up by the, the Mayor of London to avoid pollution. So that definitely does have like a, you know, a health um, and nature kind of theme there. Um, the one in Caledonian Road, giant lilies, you know, this, and then this one in, in Greenwich of uh, rhododendrons, I think that's, and my tag is plants were here first. So there is something, you know, of, of an activist in the way that I'm painting, but I think it's more about um, a step before the point of where we are actually like um, uh, maybe signing petitions or attending marches or, you know, joining the, these protests. And I think I'm, I'm really interested in that kind of earlier tipping point of, of why on earth should we care and kind of mm. focusing on, on yeah, health and well-being comes into that in terms of how much we benefit from uh, the, the beauty of, the, of, the, of a diverse natural world, um, how much that influences the way that we, we think and move and experience space in our communities and just feeling a lot more kind of, um, yeah, just colour goes a long way as well. Like, as you can see, I really love colour. And every time I paint, that's the thing that comes across so loud and clear is people want more colour in the city. Um, and I think there's there's an, an activist strand of trying to claim a bit more space for the natural world because I see so much concrete and glass and tarmac and da -da -da, you know, and it's like we're losing our green spaces. Um, so if, if as an artist I can start to kind of yeah, kind of claw back some of that with paint and also offer people a new way of looking. So quite often my, my exploration of the natural world is like a very macro study. So kind of trying to see it anew and kind of tap into that childlike glee and wonder, you know, of kind of when we would discover, I don't know, mm. tapping into my own childhood when I was kind of like foraging around and coming across some ladybirds and looking at them through a magnifying glass or kind of, you know, I'm looking at the, the real kind of the patterns of the of the the fragile patterns, the petals of a, of a rhododendron. When was the last time you stuck your nose in a rhododendron as an adult? I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's like that kind of. That's my form of activism. If you see, I mean, hopefully, kind of just encourage people to look again at the natural world and feel um, a sense of of that of its beauty um, and its fragility, and um, yeah, to kind of have access a bit of that magic. Mm. Yeah. That's lovely. I love the image of you foraging around <laughs> as, a, as a youngster. Um, I'm going to take a break to see if anybody from the audience has any questions, actually. I hope you've been thinking and listening and uh, wondering whether you have something you want to ask our panel at this stage. If you are in the audience here, you can put your hand up. We do have one in the front row. It'd be lovely to hear. Um, if we can have a microphone here. And then we'll get back to, I've got a few more questions and we've got a few more images to show you as well. Hello, um, I'm kind of interested in the, the longevity of your murals, you know, if they are designed to, to stay, how do you think they'll be interpreted in say 10 years time? Do you think about that kind of thing? Uh, to both the artists, I suppose. Can everyone hear that okay? Yeah, so a question about the longevity of your murals and the messages they send. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the paints that I use are permanent, so yeah, they won't wash away. And I think there is something really important, as you were saying earlier about like starting the conversations around kind of contemporary kind of issues and things that are happening in the news right now, but also yes, them staying and us not forgetting, because it's, we are just bombarded by so much news, aren't we, and so much noise. And then the Australian fire got completely overshadowed by COVID. Yeah. But your mural is still there, I'm assuming. Um, in Leak Street, it's got a really quick turnaround, so I think it ah. lasted for about two days. But okay. when I when I left it, I was really sad to leave my koala because I knew that it would probably yeah, not yeah. be there. But I don't know. For me, as a street, when I do that sort of street art, 
the impermanence is something that appeals to me as well. Mm. It's like it's there, people see it, and everyone is on their phones now and everything's so fast paced anyway that it's like, it's there, it made an impact for a certain amount of time and then the new cycle did change and it goes on to something else. Ah, yeah. Interesting, mm. different. I, I like to, yeah, I varnish mine to make sure that they stay <laughs> 25 years. Yeah, it depends years. where they are. I mean, in a place yeah. like that, I knew it wasn't gonna stay, yeah. but if I've done something, especially for a commission and then that gets, ruined then I yeah then I'm yeah. sad about that when it's got more of a detailed message or if it's got statistics about something that resonates with people and they want to learn and then that gets destroyed and then that is upsetting yeah 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 yeah, yeah. But yeah, more than I think the most the most powerful thing, as you were saying earlier as well is the conversations that happen whilst you're painting it yeah isn't it that definitely kind of direct contact yeah yeah but it, you know the ones that do stay I think it's a great archive mm. and then the more you know more and more will be appearing and you know you'll be able to kind of, I guess, hopefully track how successful we've, we've tackled this crisis <laughs> through, the, through the street art. <laughs> it's interesting, actually. So I'm a, I, I have to come clean and say I'm a scientist as well. So I'm, as a scientist, I'm fascinated by as well how the sort of, the, maybe the evolution of those messages. Mm. Will, do you want to say something about sort of the evolution of maybe some of the, the science behind it, maybe the facts that are being portrayed in the art, how quickly, tell people in the audience how quickly that sort of thing moves on. Yeah, no, it's very interesting, isn't it? So I think the, the, the fundamentals of, of what we know about the crisis we're facing have remained fairly static um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the fundamentals of biodiversity loss being bad and climate change being bad. Um, but it has been interesting, I mean, throughout my own education, so I remember as an undergraduate learning about just how much trouble coral reefs were potentially in. And I, I remember very vividly just turning on my computer one day and just opening the, the headlines and saying, oh my word, it's happened. I, I remember a, a great bleaching event and thinking, so soon, you know? Um, so I don't know if, the, I don't know if the, the core fundamentals have changed so much as the urgency of certain concerns. And obviously terminology has changed a bit. But I think we're, we're a lot more, I'm very hopeful because we are a lot more solutions based. That is something I've noticed in the last few years, really has come to the fore. Um, we, it's really not so much anymore that kind of the conversation is like, what could we possibly do? It's more, which of these possible choices are we gonna take? Are we gonna start having electric vehicles? Are we gonna, are we gonna really go in on wind farms? Are we gonna go in for solar power? Or what are we gonna do? And that has been a, a noticeable change to me, which gives me a great deal of hope, I have to say. And so that is interesting. It would be interesting to kind of think about, yeah, whether, whether in a few years' time we'll start seeing more of that, you know, in street art. We'll start seeing images of what we'd like the landscape to, be, to look like, you know, almost graffiti of, of wind farms would be wonderful to see. There's Victorian poems talking about the beauty of smoke columns. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we had poetry about the beauty of wind farms? That would be, you know, please make me a painting of a wind farm. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's also about the, the language is interesting, you know, uh, you say that's kind of maybe the one thing that's kind of changing also there's more voices coming into the conversation mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. so um so what we've got now are our young people's voices joining the conversation but also kind of um as well as western science there's indigenous um knowledge that's being much more greatly kind of platformed and mm -hmm. um and shared as well so i think there's there's something also about yeah the the, the, the murals that are appearing around this are becoming more and more diverse um, which is a cool Mm. Mm. Yeah, fab. You also, you mentioned, Will, uh, poetry as well. We do actually have a really fascinating, uh, another um, session in this room later today. Um, is, what's it called? The, uh, the UK's Green Poet. Oh, uh, mm. So if you're back here later on and you want to hear uh, words, beautiful words about the UK and the environment, please do come back. And if you're watching online, you can probably find it on our YouTube channel. <laughs> Just a little plug for that. Any more questions in the audience for now? Okay. Um, I was then also going to plug, because I think we we've talked a little bit, we've touched on what can individual people do yourselves and what can you do to influence others. And those of you in the room, you'll find some of these little leaflets that we've produced with the help of our scientists here at Imperial College of nine things you can do to protect the natural world. Um, and these are things that we 
are recommending as being uh, effective. Um, eat a nature-friendly diet. Um, respect and protect the natural spaces beyond your home. Make your home a haven for native plants and wildlife. We heard a bit about window boxes mm -hmm. and gardens. And be a voice for nature. In a way, really, the work of our panel members is about being a voice for nature. It's very important. Mm -hmm. um, so do look this up online. If you're here in the room, pick one up. Michelle. I, what I didn't say when I first started talking as well is that if um, you've got any local uh, conservation groups um, that you want to get involved with, that's always really helpful as well. Um, not everyone likes to speak directly to people, but maybe your forte is with, um, if you want to get involved more politically, your local councillors, um, they need to hear that we're actually, this is a, an important issue because unless we tell them that, they won't act on it and they've been very slow to act. So I think that's another way that we need to use our voices. Um, yeah, I just want yeah, to say Great, that. let's have everyone's <laughs> top tip. Come on then. That was <laughs> top tip is speak to your local councillors and make sure the people who have the power to make decisions know that you think that's important. That's what makes them act. Will? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do maybe one and a half because I'm going to piggyback a little bit on, on something. You said. So I um, get it, reach out and eat a bit less meat. So thing in terms of reaching out, I would love it. It would be amazing if everybody in this room and everybody on the internet uh, were to right now write a letter to their MP saying, I've read the Dasgupta review, which was an independent review published by the UK government that says we need biodiversity and we need to stop climate change for the UK economy. Not because it's you know, something that, that people like me who love trees you know, love, but it's something we all depend upon, that it's something that our economy depends upon. And if you write to your MP, can you imagine if everyone in this room right now did that? Can you imagine the impact that? When was the last time an MP got a letter? You know, If we hopefully often, but a letter really shows that you care. So reach out, write that letter, say it matters and I care about it. And then finally, eat a bit less meat. It's, it can be hard to go vegetarian, it can be hard to go vegan, whatever, just eat a bit less meat. Swap out a meat sausage for a, for a veggie sausage and save yourself a bit of money and save a bit of cholesterol. And yeah, so there we go, two tips. I'm sorry, I cheated. I'm so sorry. You did a little bit. I don't <laughs> I'm not sorry, actually. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Panel's prerogative. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'd Brian. say consumer power. So yeah, just pay a little bit closer attention to where your money is going, which companies you're mm. buying from, maybe have a look at your bank, if it's um, investing, you know, it's, it's money in fuel, um, fossil fuels, um, then yeah, have a look at switching your bank. That would be my tip. Okay, I'm going to challenge you all a little bit more mm. because I think some of the things that you've mentioned are not always possible for everyone, actually. People who don't have the money or the time or the knowledge to do that, what would you? Where would you direct people to for something that absolutely everyone can do? Young people, perhaps some of the young people that you're dealing with, actually, they don't have that agency yet. Yeah. What is it that they can do? I would personally say, um, if you're a young person right now, I, so I, I know what it's like, and I, I remember I cared very deeply about nature when I was when I was a child, and it is hard to, to have a direct role. And you might be thinking, I don't vote. What's the point in you know writing to an MP? You still can, you still could, you could try that, and they would listen, I think. But I would say, if especially if money is tight, eating a little bit less meat is really cheap. So convince your parents, say to them or whoever's looking after you, say, take me to the supermarket. I'm going to buy a tin of, tin of black beans. I'm going to buy a tin of chop tomatoes and then something else and go mix it up in a pot, add some spice to it and that's going to be our dinner one night a week. And I'm going to cook for everybody one night a week with these cheap tins and I'll do it so you can put your feet up. And that would be my advice. It's cheaper and I bet they'll love not having to do the work. I know I, know <laughs> I would love it if my, uh, my, my child were to do a bit more cooking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think... Um, it's about, if, you, if we're talking about the kind of the students that we were working with in these yeah. projects, so 13, 14 year olds, yes, of course, they probably don't have a bank account and they're probably not doing the food shop. Um, but I think it's, uh, you know, if we look at what Greta and all of the other young people have managed to do with the, the um, Fridays for Future strikes, there are definitely direct actions that's, that young people can make to really draw attention to how urgent 
real mm. um, real change is. Um, and also, I think it's about having those conversations with your your parents or yeah, other people that look after you or your teachers or your older um, members of your community um, to really, you know, I guess, um, encourage them, petition them to make those changes. And I think the response to the mural that, um, you know, that I finished just a week or so ago, when people realised that these were messages from 13-year-olds, from 14-year-olds, when the adults realised that, you know, they were, that really moved them and they really wanted to hear that and they were really pleased that their voices were being platformed because what came across loud and clear was they get it, like, that generation are the ones that are going to be cleaning up this mess and they are, you know, they are the ones who's most going to impact whatever the decisions are being made right now you know, what they are, that's, it's kind of, a lot of it's being left to them, so that if you're feeling angry or frustrated by that, start having those conversations with those that, that can make some more of those um, bigger bigger impacts right mm -hmm. now, and, and write to the, your MPs. And yeah, and then if you are young and you've got the time and you're allowed to go to a protest, like those Friday protests, um, I went along with some of the young people. Um, and I have to say, it was one of the best protests I've gone to because all of these young people, they are they, they are very aware of the time left to change something and getting the politicians to listen and do something about it. So they've just got this amount of energy and anger, right, like justifiably so, um, and they want something to be done about it. So it was, it was electric being part of that group. So yeah. yeah, joining those sorts of protests at school, I'm sure there are many more organizations that young people can get involved with. Well, um, youth, youth for Nature? Yeah. Would that be yeah, youth for Nature. Yeah. Someone would say very briefly what UK Youth for Nature is. So they're a new charity um, working with young people, trying to get them involved in um, political advocacy, basically. Would you, would you want to say anything more? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and they've been doing some amazing wild murals around the country, haven't they? Yeah, yeah I think it's just a really great um, opportunity for you to connect with other young people in your local area that really care about this topic and find other creative outlets and ways to communicate that and process if you're feeling anger or grief, you know, find more positive mm -hmm. ways of articulating yourself with, with like-minded people of your own age. So, yeah. And there are always community, different community groups as well. I mean... They might see like people like Friends of the Earth, RSPB. There are Greenpeace, although you have to be 18, you can go with an adult. Um, Extinction Rebellion, very family friendly as well. So there's always some sort of organization or um, yeah, that you can get involved with. Okay, gonna ask the audience now, check you're all still awake. Do you want to hear <laughs> at this stage, first of all, are there any more questions for our panel? I've got one, two. Okay, fab, I'll hold on to my question for you for just another minute then. Um, yeah, I'm just uh, interested in hearing what your experience of the pandemic and the lockdown has been and how it's uh, maybe impacted your art form or your um, way of conveying your, your activism and, and message. That's a lovely question. Does everyone hear that okay? Yeah. Uh, for me, initially, I kind of withdrew a bit, actually. I have to say, I found it really difficult, um, that uncertainty, um, losing. I lost a lot of work because apart from street art, I also go into people's homes to do murals, and obviously we weren't allowed to do that. So initially it was a lot of anxiety um, and uncertainty. Then there was a, a mural competition online um, called Home where people around the world were able to paint whatever they wanted. So I kind of co-opted our living room wall and asked my housemates if they would mind if I painted so I was there for a whole week um, and each day I found it very challenging but I kind of I'm glad that I did it because it made me push myself to do something and it was about COVID and the wet markets and a bigger sort of conversation about people eating less meat and the fact that we're, we keep encroaching into nature and that's why these things are happening we need to let the natural world have some space and not try to take over every little place anymore. Um, so I, I, I did that mural and it was, um, I, I found it very beneficial um, in terms of my activism as well, because things weren't happening, everything moved online. So I, I kind of sort of, I did drop off a little bit, I have to say, but now that things are opening up again, it's, it's great to have these sorts of events. And um, I'm a person that feeds off other people's energy as well. So it's great to be surrounded by people um, working together on something. Uh, so that's why this mural project is really great because it is cities across the country and it's in preparation for COP26, which 
should be really huge um, in terms of trying to get the politicians to to commit to making some changes. So yeah, for me, that was my experience. Um, I have lived in London 15 years, but it just so happened that I found myself in really rural Kent during lockdown. And I remember in the first lockdown, um, I, you know, I was surrounded by rolling fields and, and, for, and woodlands, and it was, it was beautiful, and um, finding a lot of peace in, in being able to walk in that space. But I remember being really hyper aware of, of the reports that were happening on the, on the news at the time about people who were being, experiencing lockdown, going through lockdown in, in high-rise buildings, um, you know, in social housing, not having any access to, to green space, and just I'm really aware of how much that impacts our mental health, and there's lots of conversations around that. <clears throat> so out of, out of that, actually, my, I mentioned earlier I was doing some wild, I think I mentioned earlier, doing wild drawing with some of the students in development of the, this mural concept, and the idea of wild drawing emerged out of that, um, mm. because I developed um, simple um, kind of drawing techniques and drawing activities that required sometimes didn't even require pencil you could just do you know uh, be drawing literally with the land um, but things that you could do uh, if you had access to green space out in the land and if you didn't um things you could do to feel more connected to nature with with house plants or with literally looking through the the, the window and noticing the clouds just like kind of noticing the the seasons change the clouds the light you know the and i did some i led some online workshops with different community groups in in areas in london um, and then I started to, when we had our next break in our lockdowns, I started to take people out on walks um, and continue to develop the, 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 the practice. And it, it's actually turned into quite a big part of my, my work now. So actually at Audience House Gallery, I was doing a residency there and spent two months developing this idea of what on earth wild drawing is with lots of different community groups. Um, and it's become far more kind of embodied and it's been really informed by the, the ecologists that I've been able to work with through this project here. So yeah kind of it really brought the, that the, my interest in science and, and health and well-being and art together in a in an unexpected way um yeah so thanks for the question if i might i realize i, I realize you were really speaking more about the art but if i might say something as well so i um uh, uh, in my lab, we sort of, even though it's not what we normally work on, uh, we ended up doing a little bit of sort of uh, a little bit of coronavirus work, and I'm very, very proud of my lab for the, for how they sort of came together and did that. And what I really took from that, and what has actually personally changed my own work, and is also maybe a, a reason I'm here right now, actually, is it was incredibly. In, I was first of all so lucky to be able to do something. I realised how how privileging it is, privileged. It is to be able to feel like you have some agency and how important that is for your own mental health. The difference it made to me was, was vast. And the second thing was that, that, you know, I'm very lucky to work with some very talented people in the lab. And the, the work we were doing as a team, we were the tiniest of cogs feeding into a tiny machine that was a cog in another machine. Tiny, 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 tiny impact. But goodness gracious me, didn't it feel good to be a cog in that machine? And did, wasn't I lucky to be able to feel like that? And I promised myself when all of this was over, and maybe it's not, we're all in masks here, right? So we had to take tests, and so it's not really all over, but I'm trying to take that to what I do now and to realize that we can all be, I can be just a tiny, even if I'm in the tiniest of cogs in this world machine, we can really turn it in the right direction. And if you, it can make a huge, huge difference to your well being if you recognize that. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your answers. Pamela Briney, you were about to say something, but I'm going to take a quick no, another no, question no. next. Okay, we good. Uh, we'll come to your question in a second, because we've got a question also from Amy, who's watching online. Um, and she says, are younger people leading the way in the fight against climate change? Now, Amy, I'm not sure if you mean leading the way compared with grown-ups, or just are they leading the way? I didn't hear the question. Are younger people leading the way in the fight against climate change? I think they're definitely bringing it to the attention of, in terms of like Greta Thunberg, for example, she is consistently um, having her message and her voice out there in, in a really great way, even, even if a lot of people don't agree with her, it's sparking that conversation. 
Um, and there are so many young activists, not just Greta, there are lots of, like you were saying, you know, indigenous people that are coming to the fore, really young people. Um, I was doing a climate workshop with some young people and I had to, well, I was giving them some examples and I was so impressed with them. <laughs> it's just like they're doing so many great things because there isn't that barrier as, as you become an adult, you're more conscious of all the things that's stopping you from doing something. But when you're a younger person, especially a very young child, you can't see what those barriers are. It's just, this is the problem. How can we fix it? And I think we maybe need to think more um, in those terms. So I would say, yes, in that way they are, because they're making us try to get more to a direct, um, to the end point and how, we, how can we fix this? I mean, I'd say through more projects like this where, where they're being given a a kind of a national platform is really vital for them to, you know, absolutely, they've, they've got some amazing contributions to make. And as I was saying earlier, it impacts them the most out of all of us. Uh, but I, I would say we need more opportunities for them to feel validated and heard and to be listened to, you know. So I think um, I'd love them to be leading the way, is my answer. I think something's changed, right? You know, um, so I, th I think they've. Thank you. You know, I think young people are doing something, and I think there's a real awareness at very high levels that people grow up, right? It doesn't feel like to me that long ago that I was sat in a sixth form classroom trying to learn about biology for exams. I think there's an understanding that this passion and this dedication and this concern is not going to go away. And so I think it's not just making an impact now, it's making an impact because people know, you know, you're going to grow up and you're going to vote. Mm -hmm. Great to hear. Thank you, Amy, for that question. Question from the person at the back there. Good afternoon. Um, I was wondering what action each of you most strongly feel the politicians should take is. Okay, everyone hear that? What is the action that you most strongly feel politicians should take? Well, committing to a Green New Deal, um, a proper Green New Deal, I think would be the most effective thing. Um, Briefly say what that is for people who haven't heard of Green New Deal. So investing in new jobs, um, more sustainable ways of producing our energy um, and all of... So, for example, the 30% the of the oceans and 30% of land that needs to be protected by 2030, it doesn't go far enough. So I think they need to actually have better targets that they're actually going to, to reach. Um, I don't think this government is committed um, to, to changing anything, to be honest, apart okay. from profiting themselves. Um, but that's where we come in, and I think we shouldn't let them get away with that. Strong words from Michelle there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you next? Yeah, so this is, a, this is an excellent question. And uh, sadly, because we're dealing with a global problem, everything is interconnected. And that, so I, I don't know if there is one thing alone that can be done. It has to be a concert of measures. But I think the most important thing is to make fundamental changes to, to agriculture so that we can feed the world sustainably. And that's the critical thing for me, to think about how we're using land to, and, and, the, and fresh waters and marine waters, to use them efficiently and effectively and in a way that maximizes biodiversity benefits. Um, so that means essentially rethinking how we do, do agriculture. And a part of that, of course, therefore, can be part of this Green New Deal. What a wonderful opportunity right now for the UK government, very selfishly, to, for the only in the interest of the UK people, to take advantage of the huge technological and engineering innovations we have to combine that with a fantastic agricultural sector we have to really power a, a new green economy. Yeah. Bryony? I mean, what these guys say. Okay. <laughs> um, I think also just, I was just saying really briefly, I think it's about um, also just, I mean, changing, our, changing this government, changing their value system, perhaps slightly less consumption and yeah, a lot more conservation on the agenda. Um, yeah. I'm gonna say take chair's prerogative and answer as well. Um, I think uh, it's already been said that climate change is a global problem. We're not going to solve it just in this country, but what we do have the power to do is to honour our commitments to um, paying for people in the developing world uh, to, and I don't really like that term developing world because we're all developing constantly, um, but uh, to be able to uh, advance with clean energy and to be able to access all the uh, benefits that uh, we've 
benefited from, but without using fossil fuel energy. Uh, but they can't do that without um, the money that our governments have promised them and have not yet delivered. Um, oh, yeah, I more answers. What, what you think? What is your yeah. response? You asked the question. What would your That's a great question. <laughs> okay. And after hearing the responses, do you have a different opinion now, or have you formed it? No, no. I was wondering if there was, thank you. I was wondering if there was any, if you had any ideas that I, that weren't heard, that I have, had not heard before right. in the news, in just the pop culture kind of answers, um, and specific ones as well, you know, not just general sweeping statements of, the government should change everything. <laughs> so, so that's totally fair. So I'll, I'll give you two very specific things that I think are in line with what we've been saying, because that totally, totally legitimate, a, a brilliant question, in fact. Um, so transitioning from our, from, we already have the technology and the capacity right now to leave fossil fuels behind in the UK. So doing that. Um, and then um, in terms of agricultural changes, less things that fart out methane, more things like plants. And wonderfully, these are all things that we know how to do now. That's the brilliant news about it. You're not going to hear something actually from us that you haven't heard in pop culture because the solutions, they're here, they are tangible. We can touch them and grab them and implement them right now. Some of them that you don't hear about very often are because the media are not very interested in them. This um, we've, we've had in the uh, recent weeks, um, people from a campaign group called Insulate Britain have been holding up the motorways around London. Insulating homes, what yeah. we call energy efficiency, is really low tech, is really well proven, um, and is so unsexy that you cannot get a media headline out of insulating anything. Um, but it's one of the most important, one of the easiest things that our government could do right now. Um, and mm. instead they appear to be, have been putting roadblocks in the way, metaphorically, um, of, of people having warmer, safer, nicer homes where they use, where they spend less on their energy. And instead, they've been decimating a, 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 an industry that could also be providing what we would call green jobs. Um, yes. All sorts of things. And on the back of that, I would just say, <laughs> like, instead of... Um, trying to kind of hold on to the narrative of these, the people that are protesting as being complete, you know, what was it, um, tree huggers? Bunny huggers. Bunny huggers yeah. Yeah. and all that, you know, it's not easy being green and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> like actually, you know, and, and instead focusing on kind of all the protest bills, um, I think that's just an absolute, a complete distraction technique. And I think that's an absolute waste of time and, 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 and money um, to be actually allowing some of these conversations to really genuinely happen and engage in that rather than try and silence them. Because, uh, uh, can I just say one uh, quick thing? It's like if, before they I silence you all. With, yeah, <laughs> if they actually dealt with those issues, people wouldn't be protesting. Yeah. So stop um, criminalising people that are trying to make a difference and a change and act on the things that they're asking you to. Here we go. We've just got to the point at which everyone's really saying what they really think, <laughs> having thing. chatted for 45 <laughs> minutes. Um, but I am going to have to draw this to a close because we're coming to the end of our allotted time in the lecture theatre. Um, and I have some things, some people to thank and some things to say before we let you go. Um, so thank you very much for our wonderful speakers. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for the people in the room. Thank you for everyone online for coming to the amazing Great Exhibition Road Festival, which we're doing again in person in South Kensington very exciting and as well for people online if you've enjoyed the event um, we're first thing on Saturday this was the first event so if you're here in the room there's plenty more going on today and tomorrow and for the rest of the week if you're watching online please do check out our YouTube channel um, and you can follow us on our social media channels as well for more of the uh, fantastic things under the um, science <laughs> and art theme and the one world theme which is, covers across the whole festival um, I'm sure there were loads more questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get around to absolutely everybody. Um, but um, come back to more events, come back next year, and maybe we'll answer your questions. Um, very finally, no, penultimately, we'd love to hear what you thought of this event. Um, as you are leaving, um, if you scan a QR code or ask one of the uh, pink vested helpers um, for a QR code to help us evaluate the festival, that will help us to make it better in future.
and it'll be posted online if you're watching this on YouTube. Finally, oh, it's up there, that's amazing. Thank you, technology. Um, otherwise, it remains for me to thank Bryony, Will, Michelle, uh, everyone who's one of our amazing helpers at the exhibition, Great Exhibition Road Festival, and thank you to you for coming. Hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you.